Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Dollarama stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Dollarama is a Canadian dollar store chain headquartered in Montreal. It's Canada's largest retailer of items for $4 or less. It has over 1,300 stores and has a location in every province in Canada. Let's get started with the model. We're going to look at the ticker that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange. The ticker is DOL.TO. They also have a ticker that trades on the pink sheets in the United States. The ticker is DLMAF. This is a large cap company, 16.4 billion market cap. They're trading at $53 a share and they have 311 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you forecast the future free cash flows and then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has positive and growing free cash flow each year. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. And the company has fairly consistent net income each year. Revenue is a sales for the company and it seems to be growing each year. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. Then the difference between those two numbers is the gross profit. So the company's gross profit in the trailing 12 months was almost identical to the 2020 gross profit. Their operating expenses have grown over the years over $800 million. So their operating income is $836 million, which is a little less than 2020. The company has been accumulating a lot of debt the past few years, so their interest payments are over $100 million. They had $200 million of taxes, so their net income was a little over half a billion dollars, and it's been that way for the past few years. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. Then here's capital expenditures. That's investments in property, plant, and equipment. And to calculate free cash flow, it's operating cash flow minus CapEx. So the company has a good amount of free cash flow each year. They had their highest amount in trailing 12 months, $664 million. In 2018 and 19, the company issued a lot more debt than they paid off. But after that, in 2020 and in trailing 12 months, they seem to be paying down a little more debt, which is good. The company buys back a lot of stock, $812 million in 2018, then half a billion, $327 million, then $181 million. The two main ways to reward investors are through dividends or to buy back stock. This company does both. So it seems like the company is generating sufficient operating cash flow each year. And that was over $800 million in the trailing 12 months. So to calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, then you have to add back the non-cash items from the income statement. They had $248 million of depreciation. Depreciation is an expense that brings down your net income, but it's a non-cash item. So you have to add it back on the statement of cash flows. They had an increase of $30 million in working capital. It looks like they purchased $42 million on accounts payable. This is when you receive a product or service without paying for it. So accounts payable improved their cash flow $42 million in the trailing 12 months. But in future years, when they pay the accounts payable, it's going to detract cash flows. Let's look at a capital structure. They have negative $92 million of equity. That means their liabilities are $92 million more than their assets. They have $3.4 billion of debt. 3.3 billion of net debt, and they pay about 3% interest on their debt. Cost of debt is 2.14%, and they're 100% debt since they have negative equity. Their beta is about one, so the stock moves with the market, and their WAC is the cost of debt, 2.14%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 19 billion, we discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $20 billion. We divide that by 311 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $66. They're trading at $53, so they're trading at a 20% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street values the company at $52. So they're saying the stock is trading at intrinsic value. So it seems like the stock has been up and down. In 2015, it was around $30. And then it was driven up to over $50. It's come back down, then back up, then back down probably around March, beginning of the year. And it looks like it's getting close to its all-time high. 
So the company has a fairly steady dividend payment, three to four cents per share per quarter, and their dividend yield is really low, 0.33%, and their payout ratio is also really low at 10%. The stock has outperformed the S&P up 17% in the last 52 weeks. The S&P is only up 14%, and the 52-week range was $35 to $55. And the stock is trading above its 50-day moving average and 200-day moving average, so it's on an uptrend. And when the 50-day moving average passes above the 200-day moving average, that's called the golden cross. That's a bullish signal. The stock has a pretty low trading volume, under 1 million shares are traded each day. And of the 311 million shares outstanding, 303 million are on float. They're available to investors. And nearly half the shares are held by institutions. And they have a really low short percentage, under 1% of the shares are shorted. FMR is a top shareholder at 10%. Then the second largest is 5.5%. Vanguard is under 3%. And then the Rossi family who started this company and Wellington at 2.3%. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 12.3. The median is 14.8. PE is stock price over earnings per share. There are 30.1. So investors are paying $30 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. There are 4.3. So they're between the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're negative since they have negative equity. The way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. And equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet. And their tangible equity is negative $1 billion. So they have close to $1 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense so they can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They have negative equity, so we can't look at the ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can only cover 70% of their current liabilities. And most of their current assets are in inventory, $623 million. The company does have positive free cash flow, but they have negative working capital, so it is possible they need more debt to run their business. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos of Big Lots, Costco, Dollar General, and Walmart, all in the same industry as Dollarama. And if Dollarama has a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're worse than the average in every single category. So to summarize, I do have the stock trading at a 20% discount because it does look like the stock is undervalued relative to their expected future growth. But it's a bit concerning they have so much debt and negative equity but this company, and along with other dollar stores, are really thriving in the pandemic. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.